before we go on to the next set of things in our SQL statement. So let me go in and build on this. Um, first thing I'm going to do is one thing that was tough to get used to when I first started writing web applications compared to other sorts of applications is you really don't have control over the user. So in other words, the user can type like anything they want to in the address bar. All right? And therefore, we know that to get to where we want them to be, that they should have first stopped at the page that has the search, and then they should go to the detail page. Uh, and if they don't do that, they're not going to have the, the ID, and they're not going to have the qu uh, query string form uh, correctly. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to keep them from typing that URL in. All right, so we must be able to somehow deal with it um, one way or another if, if they get to our page through um, a non-normal way and, and we notice that something is wrong. So what I'm going to show you today is, is just something real simple and we can expand on this. Um, what, if they, that what if they just typed in the URL of the page? So let's say... They go in here and just type in faculty detail. If you remember, they're supposed to go through first the faculty uh, by rank or the faculty search. There's a couple different ways to get to it, I think. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm getting confused with something else. There's our faculty by rank page. And we know that if we select a rank, that we can click on this link and go to that and see that person. All right. What we don't know is that they could, someone could just go in and type that URL. Not formatted correctly. And it will just not know what to do with it because it's not able to do the query because there's nothing on the query string that says what faculty member they want and so on and so forth. So what, I'm gonna, what we're going to do here is we're going to put a little check in here for that. All right? So that if they get to the page and they don't have something on the query string, we're going to boot them right back to the search page. All right? Just a couple lines of code, but it'll sort of set the stage for some other things that, that we're going to do later on. So I'm going to go into the faculty detail page. And what I'm going to do is, in the code behind, in the page load event, all right, that's something that happens um, when the page first loads, I'm going to check to see if something is on the query string, all right? And if there's nothing on the query string uh, for ID, I'm going to simply return to um, that other place, that other page, the faculty by rank page. Now, one thing to be aware, and this applies not just to ASP.NET, but this applies to uh, almost any sort of server-side web programming, is that they're typically uh, in any platform, whether you're talking about PHP or um, ASP.NET or, or any other platform, there's typically always two objects that, that are there. And they're us they usually go by this name, all right? There is the request object and the response object. In PHP, there's a request and response object, and there, there also is in .NET. And what these objects are is they have information about the request from the client to the server and the response from the server to the client. If you remember when I drew the diagram way at the beginning of the class, or at the beginning of the course, we always look like something else, and there's a request made, gets to the server, server does its thing, and sends a response back to the client. So there's objects with information about the request and response. 
And whether you're talking about something that the client is telling the server or something that the server wants to tell the client will determine if you want the request or response uh, object. Where would you expect to find the query string then? Is the query string part of the request or response object? The request. It comes from the client to the server. All right. So, and I could do this any number of ways. I'm going to do it this way. What I have is if the length of the query string field ID is equal to zero, and you can't see this. If the length of the query string field called ID equals zero, then I know that there's nothing called ID on the query string. All right? Let's break it down. Len is the length function. There's other ways to do it too, right? But len is the length function. Request is the request object. Dot query string is the query string part of the request object. And in parentheses, ID is asking specifically for the ID field on the, uh, on the query string. So what I'm saying is, on the request object, in the query string, the thing that's called ID is its length equal to zero. All right? It either is or isn't, right? If it's equal to zero, then there's nothing on the query string for ID, which means that someone typed in the URL or maybe we even we have a bad link on our page or something like that. So we could do any number of different things, all right? We could pop up a label with an error message. Let's do that first. Let's go on our faculty detail page and we'll throw a label on here. And we could, we could throw some text on there that say that invalid navigation to page, please go to faculty by rank dot asp x. We could even do one better than that, right? We could make that label contain text of an actual hyperlink to link them to it. That wouldn't be too hard. How do you suppose we'd do that? Make, a, make that label, make the text of the label be a hyperlink. Well, we could just put in the HTML code for a hyperlink. A href equals and do that. So, Now if we go to that page, if we navigate to it, faculty detail.aspx, we get 
invalid navigation of page. Please go to search page. We give them a link and they can click on that link. They can go to the search page and they can access it that way. All right. That's good, but what would, better be, what would, what would be better still than doing that? Just send them to that page, right? Um, we could just as well do that. Now, this is communication from the server to the client. Therefore, what we're looking for is going to be part of the response object, right? Because remember, the request object models the stuff coming from the client to the server. The stuff on the response object models the server's response from the server to the client. So we can actually do what's called a redirect. And we can say, if that's true, instead of setting some goofy error message, we can say response redirect. And we can put where we want to go to. In this case, it is faculty by rank dot ASPX. So now, if there's nothing on the query string for the ID, then send it to that page. I, you know, I bring this up for a couple reasons. First of all, this is a good way to introduce that, those two objects to us. That if you want information from the client to you, the server, the response object is where it is. Um, and correspondingly, if you want to send it from uh, information from the server to the client, that's what you use. We can look and see what other stuff is available on the request object. We can get a whole bunch of different stuff. User agent is information about the client's browser. All right, so we can tell that. That's one of the things that's interested, interesting, rather. Why might you want to know the client's browser? Um, you could. In, in the old days, they would do browser detection, and they would attempt to write CSS to work for different browsers. That's generally not a good idea, all right, just because you don't want to maintain two sets of CSS for that or two different web pages. But you could do it in an absolute pinch, all right. Um, I, have, I have a couple websites that I've done where there's a little piece of functionality that just didn't work on older browsers, but it was good to have. So rather than having it break on older browsers, I did a little bit of browser detection. So yeah, you, you, can, do, you can do that. That's one reason. Another reason uh, that might be a little, little better is you can, you, you can configure your page if you know what browser they're on. For example, if you recognize that the person is running Windows, you can give them the Windows download for your application. If you recognize that they're running a Mac, you can give them the Mac um, uh, download. Um, the other thing is um, you could potentially look at that user agent to see if they're browsing from a mobile device versus a desktop and maybe do something with the style sheet uh, or, or do some redirection maybe even. Maybe you have a couple of pages, all right, uh, a mobile page and a, uh, uh, a desktop version of the page and you, you do some detection to see how the user is coming to you and based on that you send them to one page or another. If you notice uh, a lot of web pages, if you go to CNN for example from a mobile device, you actually get redirected to m.cnn.com instead of www.cnn.com. So there are some reasons to do that. Um, in the old days, what you had said was done a lot, you know, the, you know rather, than, rather than trying to write code. That was back when there were really uh, even bigger still browser compatibility issues. Now the aim is to try to do everything in one, but every once in a while you cheat a little. <laughs> All right. 
But at any rate, uh, yeah, we can go in and in this case we just want the query string from here and specifically we want the ID field. I've also seen like some sites where they're doing uh, checking just to see if you use the browser until you update That's that's true too. Um, you can uh, you can check uh, uh, to see if they're using a real old browser and maybe put a gentle uh, uh, suggestion uh, to do that. For example, let's fire up Firefox here. We got a little message on that page that says, "Urgent! Your version of Firefox is no longer protected against online attacks." Blah 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 blah. Get here to upgrade. Ideally, it should still work, but um, it, it should, uh, you know, it, it's okay to tell people, to give people that information. What I don't think is good is when you start telling people that you can't access the site with this browser, unless you're talking about like ancient browsers, all right? It drives me crazy, for example, on Angel, where it tells you you have to use this browser or that browser. It's like, don't tell me what to do. I'll use a browser I want to use, you know? I know more about this stuff than you do, and if I want to use Google Chrome, I'll use Google Chrome. Make your site work for it, right? So um, w our goal is cross-browser compatibility, but there are some good compelling reasons for us to want to know what the browser is that doesn't involve us cheating and, and, and uh, writing different pages uh, just so that we can get around some IE issue or whatever. All right. At any rate, let's make sure this works before we move on to the next part. And sure enough, if we go to, if we attempt to go to faculty detail, I type that in, but I end right back up, up here, all right? Lest you think there's something up my sleeve, <laughs> I'll go here, and I'll type that in faculty detail. And as I get directed to faculty by rank. All right. So you could do redirection like that. Um, one thing that you could do, for example, on a secure site um, or site that, depending on permissions, and again, there's a lot of ways to handle permissions, is you can do redirects if someone isn't authorized to view a page or, or you know, that's one way to handle it. All right. So I want to introduce that object to you, and I wanted to point out that that one of your struggles with, not your struggle specifically, but one of these struggles with coding in ASP.NET is you have, you know, the, the syntax of the language you're using, whether it be VB or C Sharp, but you also have understanding and knowing the .NET framework. And again, the complexity of it is the reason why in this class we use uh, an IDE, uh, an integrative development environment, as opposed to most of my other classes, we don't. We use just a plain old text editor for it. Um, you could do all your, all your programming in uh, a text editor for, for ASP.NET, but that would, that, would be, that would drive you crazy. Um, so I'm willing to make that concession in, in this case and, and, and allow uh, VB. But you shouldn't use it as a crutch, and you should really understand the, the stuff that's in the framework and all that. So now's as good a time as any to talk about the request and response object, at least introduce them. All right, the next thing I want to do is, let's say we pick someone. If you notice, there's actually the name of the image for that person in the database. One of the columns One of the columns in the database, if we can pull that up here, one of the columns in the faculty table, whoops, wrong one, is the faculty image. And that's the name of the image. Now, I know some databases, probably even Access, you can actually store, sometimes they're called blobs, binary large objects, or you can, you can store uh, other file types or other kind of data. We're not doing that here. 
our web page doesn't need the actual file. Our web page needs the name of the file, right? Because if we think of how we're going to construct the image tag, the image tag is going to look something like this. image src equals and then the name of the image alt equals and then the name or not the name but the but the alt text for that image so we don't need the actual file to be stored in the database we need the name of the image file to be stored in there now in this particular example notice what I did is I put the images in a folder called images Nothing magical about that. I didn't have to do it that way. I could have put them in the root, but I just want to keep everything neat, so I put it in a separate folder so it doesn't sort of cloud the issue here. All right, so what I want to do, you know, for my next trick, what I want to do is I want to take this faculty image field, which is currently simply a text field, currently just a text field that says the name of the image, and I want to make that actually an image. All right, and when you look at this, you'll see it's pretty similar to what we've done with a link. In other words, with a link that we created when we did that back on the grid view, um, our link was partly hard coded, partly coming from the database. What part was hard coded? Well, the less than sign a space href equals. That's part of every link. That's hard coded, but. Some of the other stuff that got filled in, well, some of that came from the database. Even, for example, the uh, href equals detail or faculty detail.aspx, even that's hard coded. But the ID that we tacked on the end comes from the database. We're going to do the same thing here. The image tag that we create, some of it's going to be just hard coded. We know, for example, that all these are in the folder called images. All right. But then some of it is going to come from the database, namely that field. So let's go in and let's do this. Let's go into the detail page. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit that detail view, details view. And I'm going to remove faculty image, the text field. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to move, remove rather, the, the faculty image. So I just click on that and click X. So I got rid of it. I'm now going to go in and I'm going to add an image field. So I select that I'm going to add an image field. And I click Add. And now it's going to be very similar to what we've done with the, with, with the, uh, with the link. All right. We have four blanks that we have to fill in. The first one says data alternate text field. Underneath that is data alternate text format string. The next one is data URL or data image URL field and data image URL format string. So we have those four fields that we want to turn in, uh, uh, fill in rather. So if we look at this. I noticed one of the people that had pictures, name was Blanchard. So, the URL for his image will be images.blanchard.jpg. Alright. That's the URL that I want. Alright. And the alt text, I probably want to be picture of Blanchard. All right. And likewise for everyone else. All right. The alt text should say picture of and then we're going to pop in their last name. The um, image URL is going to be images slash and then whatever name we have stored in the database. So, it's just like we did with links, right? If you remember with links, we had a href equals faculty 
detail dot ASPX ID equals 12. Well, that 12 we replace with the actual value of the ID, right? That's a, a placeholder we'll put in there. And then finally the text we can put in there as well. And we can, you, we can make the name or the ID or whatever be the text of the link. So let's go and do that here. So the alternate text field I'm going to make as faculty first name. Or let's make it faculty last name. The format string for it, I want it to say picture of, and what do you suppose I want after the word of? I want to pop in the value of that field. So how do we do that with links? How do we pop in the value of our field into that spot in the URL? We use the bracket zero bracket. Oops. In other words, if you remember going back to the link, we had the URL for the link something like uh, faculty detail dot ASPX question mark ID equals, and then we put in curly bracket zero curly bracket, which meant the first field in this list. We're going to do the exact same thing here. The name of the field that's going to have the image is called faculty image. All right. And how are we going to format it? Well, we want images slash curly bracket zero. So that's going to be the URL for the image. The word images slash is going to be hard coded because we know that they're in that folder. But the actual name of the image comes from that database field. And where do we put that database field? Well, we put it after the characters images slash. Again, identical to what we did with the link. All right. So now let's go and look at this. We go and run this. And we can pick full professors, let's say. Blanchard, click on that, and we have actually the image of Blanchard. All right. Let's look at the at the source to see how that image tag is is created. I can't emphasize that enough. It's always a good idea to know the HTML that got generated. And in this case, the HTML that got generated is an image tag. SRC equals images slash, right, that was what I had typed in, and then the name from the database. That's where I put in curly bracket zero. That means fill it with the value of the field, the first field on that list that I supplied immediately above it. Lastly, the alt text is picture of, and then I put in also curly bracket zero for the first item on that list. All right. Now, there's some other things that we can do image-wise. If we look at the, the parameters of that image control, one thing that we can do is we can give what to display um, if there is no image for that person. You know, if you remember, um, there, was, there was no um, image for some of the people in the database. So we could put in for the text image not available and we could even go and make a little dummy image see an example of my artwork here
paint. Well, you get the idea. This isn't a class in photo editing. So I'll go and I'll save that in the same place as the other images. Save it as a GIF. And we'll say no image. And then I'll go in and I'll say the URL for null image is image.noimage.gif. And now if we go and we bring this up and we pull up one of those people that doesn't have an image, instead of just a blank or a broken image, we will see um, our dummy image, maybe. Actually, it says pictures of Jones. I picked an image and text. Let me go back and get rid of the text. That was my mistake. I thought text meant alternate text, but it didn't. It means it's actually going to show that text. All right, let's go in here and let's get rid of that. And now let's try it. why it's keep coming up with that. I thought I had saved everything and stop debugging. Save. I got rid of that null text. Images. There we go. And there we go. All right. Questions about this? You, you should notice a, a, a pattern here. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense. And, and I, I want you to, to be aware of this because this is, this is the way server-side coding works. I mean, it works this way in ASP.NET. It'll work this way. The implementation will be different, but the idea will be the same in, in other platforms as well. The idea is, is your page is comprised of some plain old static HTML with a few little blanks that get filled in from different places. Maybe from the database, maybe from the query string, maybe from here, maybe from there. But if you notice, for example, like if you look at uh, uh, Amazon's page or whatever, all Amazon products page looks the same. The difference about it is the specific image that gets put there, the specific price, the specific title. So there's a template of just plain old HTML that gets filled in with some details from different places. And again, Somehow you have to say which product you want or which professor you want or whatever. That then gets retrieved from the database, database and then the blanks get filled in based on that. All right. So again, we'll, we'll see this sort of thing over and over and over again. When we start to do inserts and deletes and updates, we're going to have a static update statement. We're going to have a static insert statement, a static delete. That's going to have a few places in it for us to put in some values. So if we're inserting a new faculty person, insert into faculty a list of column names, values, and then those values are going to get filled in from our things on the form. All right? Okay. 
I want to do a little bit more SQL now to talk about SQL that involves more than one table. All right? And when you have more than one table, you need to join the two tables together. All right? And it doesn't matter if you define a foreign key or the fields have the same name or anything like that. You still have to join the tables together. The SQL statement still has to say how the data in this table relates to the data in the other table. So let's go in to access and write a few simple queries that involve a join. All right. There's two ways that you can do a join. One is through the use of the WHERE clause. That's sort of the original way and that's the way I learned and that's the way I'm usually most comfortable with. But there's also a, a, a join statement by itself that, that works a little bit different and we'll talk about uh, some of the characteristics of this. But let's look here in our database and let's go and look at some relationships here. And let's look at the course section relationship. All right. There's a one to many relationship between course and section, which is how you'd imagine it to be, right? A given course can have many sections associated with it. You know, there's there's dozens of CISS 121 sections, for example, because that's one of our most popular courses. There's a few CISS 216 courses because that's another popular course. There's there's few CISS 143 and so on. All right. So the relationship between course and section is one to many. Now, um, if you notice in this table, um, we can see that things like the name of the course, the number of the course, and the credit hours are in the course table, which is where they belong, right? Different sections aren't going to have a different course number, right? If this is the day section or, or the, the evening section of CISS 243, if there's a web section of CISS 243, it's still CISS 243, right? In addition, all the courses, uh, all the sections are going to have the same name associated with it. For example, CISS 243 is web database integration. It's not like the day one's going to be called one thing and the night one's going to be called something else. Lastly, the credit hours are the same. It's not as though you would get four credit hours for this course and if someone took it online, they would get three credit hours. All right. So following the rules of correct database design, those attributes don't depend on the specific section. They only depend on the course. So therefore, they're in the course table. Now, what sort of things are in the course section? Well, the course ID is in there, right, to establish the relationship between the sections so we know what course this section is a section for. They have a term ID, right, so they can keep multiple terms in the same table. So, you know, like how coming up is summer and fall, and in our database I'm sure would have spring, summer, fall, and maybe even go, going back a few years. There's a section number. There's a faculty member that's teaching the course, the ID number that is. All right. There is the day and the time and the room number as represented by the location ID. And finally, there is a maximum enrollment and a current enrollment. In other words, how many people are enrolled in the class, uh, how many people at most can be enrolled in the class, and how many are currently enrolled in the class. Actually, that field, current enrollment, a siren should have went off in your head when I said that. That shouldn't be in that table. Why not? Why shouldn't current enrollment be in that table? Because we can simply count how many students are enrolled through this table. That's a derivable field. So we have a list of students that are enrolled in a section here, and we have the current enrollment over there. That's redundant data. If someone were to drop the section, 
and their row came out of this table, a second change would have to be made to make sure that that remained accurate. And that's not a good thing. At this point, I'll remind you, I did not create this database. Uh, this is a standard Microsoft sample database going back, I don't know, probably several years. But I did want to point that out. All right. So let's say this is what I want to see. All right. And for now, I'm not going to worry about the term. All right. In fact, I'll just pick a term. Uh, I just won't worry about the term for now. All right. Well, I don't want to cloud the issue. Let's say this is what I want to see. I want to see the call ID, which is the course number, the course name, the credit hours, the day, the time, running out of space here, the section number, the name of the faculty person that's teaching it, and the building and room number for every course that's available right now. All right? So, in other words, I want to see course. From the course table, I want these three fields. I want several from the section. I want several from the faculty, and I want several from the location. All right? Now, I, I overheard a little bit of the discussion before class, and one thing about queries like this, you can view it going in any direction. You, there, there isn't like a main table of the query and then the other tables that are related to it. All right? You simply have to include all the tables that you need to include. The other thing is you need to be able to draw a line between the tables that you want to use. All right. For example, I, I, won't, I was going to draw it, but let's, let's trace it here. From course, I can go and get sections. From sections, I can go and get the room. And from sections, I can go and get the faculty member. I think the line is, hmm. I forgot to define that one. All right, now there's a line there. All right, so in other words, I can get there from here. <laughs> All right, you have your four tables. There has to be a path with linking fields between each of the fields in the chain. Now, for example, if I wanted to add to this, that I wanted to get the students that are in these, all right, I couldn't merely add the student table, all right, because from the student table, there's no connection between the student table and the course section. There's, uh, let me rephrase that, there's no direct connection between those. I would need to include also the enrollment table. So sometimes you include tables just to make sure that you can go from there to there. They're like, you know, they're like stopovers, if you will. All right. So the first thing is, is you have to join. You have to be able to, to physically see the connection between all the tables. And there needs to be a connection between each of the tables that you want to pull data from. And sometimes that will involve you having to include other tables that you don't necessarily want to pull any data from, but you need it to, to complete the link. Now, the first syntax I'm going to show you is using the WHERE clause for this join. All right? So, our SELECT statement is going to start out the same. All right? I'm going to say SELECT CALL ID COURSE NAME Credit hours. Day. T 
time. I'm going to put these in brackets because those might be reserved words in SQL. Secnum. Faculty last name. Building code. And finally, room number, which is just room. So I specify, just like I did before, the list of the columns I want to see. All right? Irrespective of what table they're in. All right? So th this comes from, some of these come from each of the tables. All right? My from clause then has the name of all the tables that I'm going to use anywhere in my query. So not just the tables that these columns come in, but if I have another table in there that maybe I use down in the where clause, I need to include that here as well. So in this case, the tables that I am using are from course, Course section, faculty, and location. Now, we're not done yet because we haven't told it how to match this data up. We haven't said how to match the section with the course and the course with the or in the section with the professor and the, and the section with the room. We haven't defined any of that. All right? Now you might say, gee, we have foreign keys for all those. Don't matter. Don't matter. You have to explicitly say what you want. So with a WHERE clause, you simply match up those fields that match. So, for example, I will say WHERE Course dot CID equals course section dot CID and course section dot FID equals faculty dot FID and course section location ID equals location dot location ID. Now, one thing that you should notice different, all right, in the WHERE clause, I'm simply matching up columns. But notice these names of columns look a little different than the names of columns uh, up here. Why are they different? This, for example, here I say course.cid. Yet up here I just say C name. Why can't I just say CID down here for that? Or why can't I just say FID? Well, again, not which database, which table. Well, why didn't I have to do that for this? I didn't, don't I have to specify the table for FL name? I had to do it for FID, but I don't have to do it for FL name. I don't say that that comes from the faculty table. I don't say that this comes from the section table. Yet down here, I say that it comes from the faculty table or the section table. Yeah, on the top I'm listing the columns, that's true. But these are just columns too. You know, it, it seems inconsistent. Here's the answer, all right? The answer is that all of these column names, there's only one column among the tables I'm looking at with that name, all right? In other words, 
of, out of these four tables, there's only one column called FL name. All right? So I don't have to specify the name of the table. All right? Down here, there's a CID both in the course table and in the course section table, right? The foreign key. There, there should be. That's what matches them up. Therefore, if I don't specify which table I want, it's going to get confused and it's going to give me an error. Look at it this way. All right? If I am in, if I'm the only one in this room named Michael, all right? And someone comes in and says, Michael, I have a question for you. I'll turn and say, yeah, what is it? And there'll be no ambiguity. None of you will be tempted to answer that question because you know, that's not your name. However, if me and Michael Jordan were in the room and someone came in and said, do you know Michael is one of the best basketball players I've ever seen? You know, we're both liable to say, oh, thank you very much. Right? There's ambiguity there all right? because two of us are named Michael. And therefore, you can't use just one name to refer to Michael you have to go and use the full name. Michael Zellers, Michael Jordan. All right? Same idea here. There's only one column in these four tables called C name. So I can just say C name. Give me the course name, C name. And then there's no ambiguity like, well, which C name do they mean? Do they mean it from this table or do they mean it from that table? These columns, however, there are more than one and therefore, you have to specify the full name. Um, I'll go in and I'm going to enter this query in. And I'll type it in a notepad so we can take a good look at it. And then I'll paste it in the access and we'll run it. And then I'll make a couple of mistakes to show you, um, to show you the kinds of things that you might run into. So let's go in a notepad. And I'll say select call ID C name C credit day. I'm putting these in square brackets because I don't want to tempt fate. Those are likely to be reserved words in SQL and give me grief. Secnum FL name. Building code, room number. No, it's just room. From course, course section, faculty location, where? Course.CID equals course section dot CID and course section dot FID equals faculty dot FID and course section dot location ID equals location dot location ID. All right. So let's go and let's paste that into access. I'm going to go and create a query. I'm going to go into SQL mode, paste that query in, all right, and then run it. And there you see a list of all the sections, all right, all the courses with their credit hours and the day of the week and the time and the section number and the faculty name 
and the building code and the building room. Let's make some mistakes here. All right. First mistake I'm going to make is I'm going to not put location in front of LOCID. Let's see uh, how Access handles that. And by the way, you could build these queries right into ASP.NET. All right, uh, I'm doing it here just for variety. All right. Once I do that, I can actually save the query and I can actually call that query from my .NET. Um, in, in other databases, that's known as a view. All right. But if I don't say location.locid and run this, I get an error. And it tells me the specified field LOCID could refer to more than one table listed in the from clause. In other words, which LOCID do you mean? Which Michael do you mean? All right. And therefore, you have to go in and do that. And, and refer to it. Now, the one thing I didn't mention, but if you read between the lines, you can see, is I can put the full name here. So I can say course.callID, course.cname, and so on. I can always get the full name. For example, if I'm the only Michael in the room and someone came in and said, Michael Zellers, I have a question for you. Okay. You know, they didn't need to say Michael Zellers, right, because I'm the only Michael here, but I'm not going to be confused if they say that. I'll still know that they mean me. And it's not like when a parent uses a first name and last name that that, that means that, that you're angry with the database or anything, you know. Uh, it's just you can, you can give it the full name and, and that'll work just as well. So let me go in and paste that. I forgot to correct that. All right. And it works the same way. Now, here's a classic mistake that people sometimes make sometimes, and that is if you left off the where clause. All right. Let's say we left off the where clause altogether. All right. Actually, I'm gonna, I'll do this. I'll just cut, I'll copy this, and paste it into my SQL statement. And there's no where clause. If I run this, watch what happens. I have 9,360 rows in that query. Uh, excuse me? There's only 12 sections in the whole database. <laughs> Where did the other 9,000 and change come from? In database terms, that's known as a cross product. All right. What's a cross product? It's where you match everything in one table with everything in the other table. Now, in this particular case, we have four tables. So it's going to match everything in table one with everything in table two. Then all of those combinations is going to match with everything in table three. Then all of those combinations is going to match with everything in table four. So in other words, instead of getting our 12 courses, we're going to get however many rows are in table one times however many rows are in table two times however many rows in table three Table four, and my guess is that product turns out to be 9,230 or whatever that number was. All right. Now, if you only forget part of the where clause, the symptom is the same, it's just a little less dramatic. So if I only go in and I do, let's say, two parts of the where clause, all right, and not the third, then the symptom will be the same. In other words, I'll get more rows than I thought, but I won't get 9,000. I'll get whatever's in those times the number of rows that are in that last table. So in this case, I have... 156 rows. 
sure sign that you didn't do something correct in your join is when you get way more data than you expected. All right? If you get way less data than you ex expected, you might have also done something wrong. For example, let's say, I don't say LOC ID here, I say, you know, um, room, and I get that wrong. It gave me an error because it knows one's a number and one's a string. I'll have to be a little trickier. All right. That's weird. It only gave me eight of the sections. All right. Why? Because my um, where clause was wrong, and therefore it didn't know how to join those up properly. If I do it properly, then I get 12 sections. All right. Now, one thing about this join is this is called a... Um, this is called a, a natural join. In fact, well, let me look up the terminology. I, I do have to confess that the terminology sometimes Yeah, a natural join uh, or an inner join. All right. The name isn't important. All right. What's important is with this kind of join, there has to be something in all four tables to match up, or it won't show at all. What does that mean? Let's go for one of the courses, one of the sections. and remove the faculty number. No, I don't want to be in the faculty table. I want to be in the section table. There we go. Let's remove the faculty number for this last two sections. So now instead of 12, we're going to get 10. There we go. We get 10. Where did those other two go? Well, by removing the faculty ID from the section table then, there no longer is a match between that section and a row in the faculty table. So with these kind of joins, all right, the path has to go all the way through, otherwise it's not included. If, if there's something that doesn't match in one of the tables, then it's not included. Now that may or may not be what you want, right? For example, um, I would think in this case that that's probably not a good idea. Just because a room is not assigned, let's say, or a faculty person isn't assigned to a course, you still would want the course to appear. You just show a blank for the, for the room and a blank for the faculty ID or, or faculty name. All right? That's uh, other kinds of joins. That's an outer join 
And unfortunately, we won't talk about those today because we just have a couple minutes left. All right? I would think for your first assignment or so, inner joins should be sufficient. And we can look at outer joins uh, after we return from break. Now, before I wrap up today, just as sort of uh, parting words, as you know, next week is spring break. It's a great opportunity for you to catch up on stuff if you've fallen a little behind and, and so on. Um, it's also a good time to start thinking about the project. Um, you, you know, I mean, it, it's amazing to me that they we're this far along in the semester already. I mean, it, it, it's still like I have to think about my schedule, what it is each day, right? You know, it seems like we're a few weeks into it, and, and it, it's almost hard for me to believe that we're eight weeks into it because time flies so fast. Well, time will continue to fly fast, and it'll be towards the end, and therefore, anything you can do to start thinking about um, your project, what you want to do, and the database design, it, it will be time well spent. Uh, I, I do encourage you to, to like send in your design, um, even before you're done, if you want me to take a look at your database design especially, and, and that, that I think that will be beneficial to you. Um, I have had students that say things along the lines of, you know, gee, we don't know how to do all of this yet. You know, so therefore I can't start on the project until we learn how to do all of it. No, uh, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the real world. All right, I, you know, geez, I've started plenty of projects where I had no idea how to do a piece of them, but I did the piece that I could do, and then I worried about those other pieces later. So yes, we have not talked about how to add rows to a database table or to delete rows or to modify rows, but we have talked a pretty good amount about queries. All right, so any of the queries you can do. We've talked about database design, so you can design that. You can design master pages and site maps, and you can, do, you can do a good portion of it and just trust that by the time it rolls around, we'll be able to, um, um, you, you'll be able to do uh, the remainder of it. Any questions about anything? Yes? On our lab assignment, when we're sending it in, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first of all, you shouldn't move it into the app data folder. That's where it should be all along. All right? So when you're developing it, and I'm not sure maybe it was just the wording that you, you said and all that, but when you start developing it, it should be in that table. All right? And the way that you'll know if it's right is if you look at your web config file, If your database is in the data directory and your web config file looks like this, where you, do, where you have data directory there and you do not have like an actual physical path like C users, you know, mzellers slash, you know, CISS 243 or something like that. If you have that path in there with the data directory and it's in the app data folder, then you'll be fine. All right. Usually what happens is either, <laughs> boy, this, this is a, a brilliant statement. I say either you get it right or you don't. <laughs> All right. If you don't get it right, we talk about it the next lab. We show you how to make sure that it is right, and, and then you'll be right the rest of the way. So, um, you know, that's the way that you can, you can check yourself uh, is, is look at your web config file. Uh, make sure it's in the app data folder. Make sure that that your, your connection string looks, is looking for the data directory as opposed to a specific physical directory, and you'll be okay. Other questions? Alrighty, see you up in lab. <laughs>